In this section, we're interested in the forces actually acting on the diaphragm, such as shear and moment, and how those are resisted. Two things to keep in mind for this topic. One, diaphragm design forces are different than the story shears. We already saw this in flexible diaphragms. Just repeat the same process for rigid diaphragms. Two, when we consider diaphragm design, we don't consider accidental eccentricity, only inherent eccentricity. This means that in the case that the center of rigidity and center of mass are aligned, it's a fairly straightforward process. If they're not aligned, it gets a little bit more complicated. In this particular example, we'll be able to see both cases. Let's look at the forces that we would consider for diaphragm design. These are the forces right down here. You'll notice that we apply them at the center of mass. We're still considering the inherent eccentricity, but we're not considering any displacement from the center of mass, that is, accidental eccentricity. You'll also notice that the value that we're using here is 110 kips. Previously, we were using 100 kips. Here, we're showing the loading in the x and y direction, but instead of showing point forces at the center of mass, we're showing distributed forces proportional to the mass that they act on. This is exactly the same procedure that we used for flexible diaphragms. In the case of loading in the x direction, because of the opening, we're showing the loading acting separately on the two different cantilevered sections of the slab. That's the only difference that you've seen from what we've done with loading in flexible diaphragms. Let's remind ourselves how these forces are resisted by the diaphragms. Cords are the elements that resist moment through tension compression couples, typically at the edges of the slab. And I've shown here the cords that we'll be considering for loading in each of the directions. For loading in the x direction, the tension compression couple is at the top and bottom end of the slab. A lot of this is already taken up by the wall, but we do need to make sure that these additional sections on the cantilevered sections of the slab are able to resist the tension and compression force that will be generated. For loading in the y direction, we could have placed a beefy beam right here and then placed cords at the very edges of the slab. I've chosen not to do that. I'm taking the cord over the extreme most continuous part of the slab, and so I'm choosing the cores where they're shown on grid line 2 and on grid line 1. Collectors are elements that are on the line of the lateral force resisting elements perpendicular to the direction of loading, and they take the inertial force generated in the slab and deliver them to the lateral force resisting elements. We already covered collectors and flexible diaphragms. The procedure is no different here, so I won't cover it again in this section. We can see the collectors along grid lines 1 and 2 for loading in the x direction. We can see the grid lines along lines A, B, C, and D for loading in the y direction. Let's start now analyzing the simpler of these two cases, loading in the y direction. Loading in the y direction is simpler for two reasons. One is that there's no difference in the x-coordinate of the center of rigidity and the center of mass. That is, there's no inherent eccentricity. The other reason is that the cantilevered portions of the slab don't come into play as they will for loading in the x direction. So I'm showing here in the diagram once again a sketch for the diaphragm, cords, collectors, and the distributed load. First, we need to calculate the distributed load, and the load is given by the mass of each area divided by the total mass of the diaphragm. We then divide the load by its respective width to get a distributed load. I should remind us at this point that I haven't kept track of units anywhere in this example, but all forces are in kips, all distances are in feet. So this distributed load is in kips per foot. We can place the values of distributed load on the diagram, as we've done over here on the left-hand side. So now we have values attached to that distributed loading. Next, we need to find what the forces are in the walls perpendicular to the loading. We calculate the wall forces by this equation, following the principle that the force in the wall is proportional to the rigidity of that wall. The 110 kips here is the design force for diaphragm design. Because there's no inherent eccentricity, torsion doesn't come into play, and we can simply say that the force in the wall is proportional to rigidity. We have these calculated values. We can locate them on the diagram at each of the respective walls. We recognize that this diaphragm can be viewed as an analogous beam, as I've shown here. The same distributed load, the same forces in the walls, 
but we've compressed them now and made it look a little bit more like a beam. This is a problem that you know how to solve already. It's not trivial. You definitely need to put a little bit of work into it, but this is something that at this stage shouldn't be too complicated. So I solved this. I solved it by hand. I had my hand sketches, and then I came and tried to put it into the presentation. I realized this is going to take forever to sketch up for the presentation. So I consulted a web app, I put in the loading values, and I got these loading diagrams. You'll see that we had to do it slightly differently. I declared these two wall forces right here as loads, and I put in supports at the extreme ends, but you'll notice that the values that came out of the calculation are equal to the wall force. So this actually served as a nice check. Having now the shear and moment diagrams, we can find the design forces. First, we'll look at shear. The maximum value of shear is indicated in the red oval, 42.1 kips. Usually, we report it as shear per unit depth of the slab. So divide that by 30 feet to get the shear design value of 1.4 kips per foot. Part of the slab is actually less deep. So there's a section that's only 20 feet deep in the center section. However, the shear values are much, much smaller. So even if I divide them by a smaller number, 20, it's still not going to get as large as this 1.4 kips per foot. So now I've identified the critical section of the slab given this shear diagram. Moving on to the moments, we find here the maximum moment of 586.38 kip feet. The chord force is found by dividing by the distance between the chord elements, this 20 feet right here, to obtain a chord force of 29.3 kips. So we now have the shear per unit length for design. We have the chord force to resist moment. We would also have to look at the collectors, but we're not doing that in this section. So we've covered all the necessary quantities for diaphragm design in the y direction.